Now that there's a recording, we're glad to have Dave Anderson from Ohio State. He's going to tell us about the direct sum morphism in equivariant Schubert calculus. And one, and one caveat is we may get kicked out of this room at the end of the hour, which may mean the question period, which is normally leisurely, might get cut short if people still think that was. Okay, so uh, thanks, Ravi, for the introduction and everyone for being here in this room and online. Um, to the folks online, I'm going to apologize. I'm I'm in a room. This is um, new, and so I'm not going to be looking at the camera. I'm going to be looking over here. Uh, and to the folks in this room, I apologize. I'm probably not going to be looking at you either. I'm going to be looking down here. But, <laughs> um, but so I, I'm glad to be here to tell this story about the um, the direct sum morphism in um, equivariant Schubert calculus. And for people looking, let's see if I can move that window. Is that a little better for you? Move it through there. Um, I'm going to follow the sort of uh, generic math talk format where I will spend at least half of the talk talking about things that have been known for ages. And then um, somewhere along all the line, I'll talk about things that have been discovered more recently. And towards the end, I'll say some things that um, maybe I had a part in, and I'll end with some things that I, I think nobody knows. Uh, or those, those questions may be scattered along the way. Uh, so in terms of content, uh, the goals here are, um, um, well, among the goals are the following. So I wanna tell you something about uh, positivity for structure constants in Schubert calculus. So this is a, an old story, um, but I'm gonna be talking about a, a dual version of these structure constants, which is maybe less well known. Um, honestly, my uh, entry into this was more um, related to trying to find an elementary uh, description for what's called the Poincaré product on, um, on affine Grassmannians. And it turns out the, the infinite Grassmannian will be much easier to talk about. So that's what I'll talk about. So this is a product on the homology of these spaces, which is um, unusual unless you know um, what the affine Grassmannian is, in which case um, you already know what it is. Um, and then finally, I'll, I'll say something about how this leads to a nice, <clears throat> this perspective leads to, I think, a nice presentation of the integral uh, equivariant uh, cohomology of the affine Grassmannian, which is interesting for, um, for um, lots of reasons, I suppose. Okay, so let me say some things about uh, Schubert calculus, and I'm gonna um, I'm gonna jump right into the infinite setting, but um, um, you shouldn't be worried about infinite Grassmannians. All that's gonna mean is that. I'm gonna look at some Grassmannian of middle dimensional spaces in an even dimensional vector space where M is really big. So this is um, fixing notation. I've got a vector space with basis indexed by the integers. Um, any countable dimensional vector space will, will do. And inside there, I'm gonna often look at uh, kind of sy symmetric intervals around the origin of dimension uh, 2N, 2M. Um, Occasionally, I'll use uh, notation, well, maybe just once. The, the notation just means that this is uh, it, the, what's, what's spanning the vector space. Okay, so the, we, we got this grass money, and it's just a um, half dimensional spaces in C2M. And um, if you take the, the union of, of these spaces as m goes to infinity, you get what's what I'm going to call the infinite grass money. Um, sometimes this is referred to as the Sata Grassmannian. If you would like a kind of intrinsic de description of it, it's all subspaces of this infinite dimensional vector space, um, which contain a standard subspace. So this is the span of everything less than or equal to minus m, are contained in another standard space and have this kind of Fred Holm condition um, on the kind of index of a projection to one of these subspaces. So th this is just a normalization. You have to do this in order to get a reasonable manifold. But um, I, and, and I encourage you to think of it as just one of these. By, by, um, by reasonable manifold, you don't mean reasonable or manifold. You mean reasonable but not manifold. It's, 
Some, sometimes people call it a Hilbert manifold. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, actually there's a bigger one that's more often called a Hilbert manifold, but it's covered by infinite dimensional affine spaces in, 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 in a good way, yeah. So that, yeah, this thing is nice and smooth. But yeah, yeah, in, in practice, it's really just, this is how you want to think of it. Uh, I'll say one more thing about, um, about this. You can imagine, um, you know, oftentimes you've got the, uh, you think about Grassmannians in terms of maybe type A Dinkin diagrams, and you've got kind of nodes going off like this. And if you, if you pick a node, you know, and then let the Dinkin diagram go off in, in one direction, you get a different Grassmannian than this one. So you could look at all two dimensional spaces in C infinity, and that's not this one. This is, this is looking at, um, you know, pick a node, but then grow the Dinkin diagram in kind of both directions at the same time. So fix your middle node and grow in both directions. And um, for that reason, I'm, I'm often gonna fix that node to be called zero and we're gonna look at negative indices as well as positive indices. It's just more convenient to do things that way. So I have a question about this sort of approximation by a GER at MC2N. Yeah. If you take some open in GER B, is it always true that it's contained in one of these like half dimensional Grassmannians? Um, is it something that straightforward? So, An open in, in the infinite dimensional GER V, I will declare to be a set which intersects with every one of the finite dimensional ones in an open, but it will generally not be contained in any, any one of them. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, be a compact, very fine compact open. Sure, okay. Also, the question for Arnav is, what's this guy's homotopy type? Is it BU? It is. It is BU. It is BU. Yes. Yes. Um, good. Other questions? OK. So I want to talk about um, Schubert calculus here, and this is just the Grassmannian. So I want to say something about the Schubert varieties in here. And so this thing has a, a stratification um, by Schubert varieties. And um, I've, I've kind of, I guess, learned from hard experience that I can't give you much of an idea of what these things are. There's a definition for you. Um, their, their incidence conditions, the, uh, the only thing to keep in mind is I'm, I'm placing some incidence conditions on some standard subspaces there. Um, these are universal degeneracy loci in some sense. If you've got any map of vector bundles on a variety um, and you wanna know where that map drops rank, you can pull it back from one of these. Um, yeah. But the important thing to know is that they, they stratify the Grassmannian. Uh, there's one for every partition uh, which, by which I mean a non-increasing uh, sequence of positive in, or non-negative integers. Um, and um, yeah, and, and in fact, if you, if you replace all these things with, with equalities, then you get something that's akin to an affine uh, cell decomposition, although I hesitate to say that because all of these would be infinite dimensional cells in this case. So, so yeah. Um, Right, so uh, for example, I'm gonna write partitions occasionally, either Young diagrams. Um, this partition has size seven. And, and what I've just said about the cell decomposition, still, this still works in infinite, in this context, in infinite dimensions, if you give the right notion of cohomology, um, you, you, get a, um, you get a basis uh, of Schubert classes for the cohomology of this uh, infinite dimensional manifold, one for each partition. And so the, the co-dimension of these things, they all have finite co-dimension, and so, um, and so they, they live in, um, um, in that degree. How would you define cohomology of an infinite dimensional space? I have not seen this before. Great, so it depends what kind of cohomology you look for. So this is not a very infinite dimensional space. So uh, I guess the question here was, how is, uh, how is cohomology of an infinite dimensional space defined? So this is a co-limit of nice finite dimensional spaces. So here's a working definition. 
um, cohomology is contravariant, you would like the co-limit. So the cohomology of a co-limit should be the limit of cohomologies. And, and in fact, if you, so I'll say the words, uh, check Alexander Spanier cohomology um, for these spaces and this co-limit, that desired fact is a true fact. It's a calculation rather than a convention. So yeah, that's all this. Then don't you expect maybe that you get like a uncountably, like the dimension is like uncountable somehow? Like it, that's a, you yeah. like a flower series, right? Great. Yeah. Time. So the question is, don't you expect that the uh, the you should get an uncountable power series ring if you do an arbitrary union? Of course, you will do that. And if you if you if you do the try to do the same thing naively with flag varieties, you'll run into that problem. But with the Grassmannian, um, the you know, there's only finitely many partitions of any size, right? And um, and what that says is that this, these these things all stabilize. Uh, so it, it actually so we're taking this is a, a, a limit in the category of graded means. So so in, in the graded sense, you don't it doesn't it's not a problem for the grass model. So yeah, thanks for the questions. Um, okay, so one of the things that um, that people think about in Schubert calculus is, well, we've got this nice basis. It's supposed to have something to do with degeneracy loci, um, or uh, it's somehow geometric, but let's try to multiply in that basis. And uh, so this is something that people have been doing for many years. Um, and these, uh, the, so if you multiply the basis, you can expand in that basis too, and you get structure constants for a ring. And these are the famous little Richardson numbers. Um, and they're, they're famously not negative for any number of reasons. Um, there's um, many um, um, formulas for them. Uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, I guess I mentioned by the, the graded, the fact that this is a graded ring, um, we know when you know, that, that they have to be zero unless the kind of degrees add up. Um, so there are all, all kinds of wonderful formulas for, for these, um, you know, um, some people, I'll, I'll, maybe I won't write this, but the, the field algebraic combinatorics is in some sense about, about this. Um, it, it's about a lot more too, but I, I like to think of it as, it's, uh, I mean, a starting point is just think about the formulas for these. Um, so that's not what I'm gonna go into here, but just know if you don't already that, that this is a beautiful subject. Um, Okay, so let me let me show you how you compute the cohomology of, of the of this um, infinite Grassmannian. It, it's rather easy to do, um, and then we can uh, talk about something else. So um, the the finite dimensional Grassmannian is kind of maybe has a well known presentation um, where you take the uh, I'll probably write this again later. That the CIs are going to be some churn classes. In fact, they're going to be segregate classes of um, of a of a tautological bundle, um, and then the the relations are all coming from the Whitney sum. And everything I've just written is about to disappear. Uh, so sorry for because that's how I um, set this up. But so the the relations come from Whitney sum, and the fact is that you've got uh, they, they all they all kind of live in high degree so that if you take um, if you take a limit um, as m gets big then those relations will just uh, go away and you're going to get a polynomial ring in indices so th there's there's the, the homology ring um, a, as a ring with generators it's just a polynomial ring one generator in each um, positive integer degree and it makes sense at this point to, to, um, to call these Cs now the turn classes, uh, I guess I really want to say the segregate classes of, of the tautological subbundle of this infinite dimensional space. So this is again, okay, it, it's an infinite dimensional vector bundle, but, but that's okay. You, you can figure out how to compute with these things. Um, yeah, and maybe I'll, I'll say also another way you can think of it. So this is the churn, I'm, I'm thinking of this as the churn series to get a given churn class, you're gonna pick off 
uh, um, the proper degree coefficient. But it's nice to think about taking churn roots. So if I write it this way, it's going to look like these are churn roots um, of of the uh, of the tautological bundle. Yes. That's I less than zero. Again, the, so I, I tried to warn you, I'm going to use I less than or equal to zero um, because I, I like to fix the zero node. It doesn't matter. This is just a convention. It, it, it will come up maybe a little bit more later. I, I, I learned this from, um, from Thomas Lamb, Sujin Lee, and, and Mark Shinozano and their oh, work. OK, so it's actually, it's actually reasonable. And since at any finite stage, you're giving the names, and that's like a reason. It's actually quite reasonable. You want the sub. And then as the um, okay, I think I can almost convince myself it's reasonable. I like to think so. It's you know I didn't I I alighted um, how I'm uning unioning up these uh, these Grassmannians. But here's how I like to think of it: I'm adding on, I'm, I'm embedding a vector space and a bigger vector space by adding on a negative basis vector and a positive basis vector at the same time. And I'm, and I'm taking an m-dimensional subspace into an m plus one-dimensional subspace by tacking on that negative basis vector. And that's my convention. And, and that convention kind of leads me to, uh, to this, to, to this, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. So, yeah. So I want to do something now that is sort of like, um, that has been I mean, thought about in the finite dimensional case quite a lot, and to some extent in the infinite dimensional case. But this is something that you can do. Um, I guess you can do this in finite dimensions, but there's something you can start to see that's happening in infinite dimensions too. Um, so there's a map from the the product of um, of two of these in, uh, uh, Grassmannians to the Grassmannian of the, of the direct sum of these spaces. And it just takes, take, take your subspace and send it to the, the direct sum, right? And, um, and the, the kind of thing that happens in infinite dimensions is that you know, this thing is isomorphic again to GER V uh, because count of middle dimensional, countable dimensional. And so that's something special here. Um, but um, right, so so then you can look at the pullback map on cohomology, and we computed the cohomology. I'm, I'm abbreviating here. This is, and I'm using a little bit of decorating of notation. But so these Cs are again, they're going to be the segregated classes of some sub bundle um, uh, here, like um, the tautological sub bundle here, and. Kind of because of this isomorphism, it has the same cohomology ring. You can pull it back by this map, and you get uh, um, something here, which is again just um, a, a tensor product of two of them. So you, you're taking uh, C's, C variables. Here I've done. Here I've kind of worked out the calculation, but maybe the thing to to look at is just um, what the final formula is. The, the KC variable just goes to the sum of kind of, of, of two, um, you know, one from each factor. So it's something fairly symmetric. Okay. So what we want to know is just like before. Um, so when you, you have something like this, you have, you can you can look at the co-product on Schubert classes. So we wanted to multiply in the Schubert basis. Let's let's do the, the co-product in the Schubert basis. So there are these. Um, some coefficients um, will, will come out. This is just because uh, of the fact that they form a basis. But, um, but in fact, uh, these numbers are the same as the numbers that you get when you multiply. Um, and so that's sort of a remarkable fact. Um, and what's happening here is that the, the cohomology ring is a, is a hop algebra. And, and this basis happens, is self-dual with respect to that. So I, I so, 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 so this should be. I mean, if if you if you you know said it with a very firm voice that clearly this is true, everyone would nod their head. But this is like a completely really non-obvious it, statement. It's right? totally non-obvious. Yeah, like, it, it, this has no right to be true. Initially, a priori. Right, right. 
Okay. It, and, and in fact, um, so kind of, there's another, there's an algebraic point of view on this, which is that uh, this ring um, is naturally the ring of symmetric functions. And I'll mention that later. And, and Zelovinsky, I think was the one who kind of pointed out that you can just characterize sure functions, which are the ones that correspond to this by the Hopf algebra property that they are like self-dual. Like it, it's just a total miracle that this happens. Um, and yeah, so what I'm gonna talk about shortly is equivariant homology and it's, this will just not be true anymore. And so that, that's more evidence that this is miraculous. So, so I mean, is it possible to say a lot, like I imagine like, when you show it's true, you can kind of never see Argument or how, how do you well, why is it true? I, I wouldn't know how to I wouldn't know how to tackle it. Uh, yeah. Um, other than just find small So let, let me give one. So let me like answer that partly by citation. So one reason that it's true is um, is there's this neat construction where you can take the direct sum of two Schubert varieties. You can do this. So th these the, the folks I mentioned here, Bergeron, Satili, and Thomas Neon. Um, did this in the finite setting, but it works just as well. Um, and you can realize that as a as a Richardson variety, which is to say, it's an intersection of of two um, opposite Schubert varieties. And now, when you intersect, so when you intersect two opposite Schubert varieties, you, you want to intersect it with a third one. And if you do that, triple intersections are kind of what govern structure constants in cohomology. Like, so this is structure constants in cohomology, and this is co-product. And this is naturally going to be equal to a, um, a triple intersection. So I'll kind of use language here a little bit, but so something like that. And since um, part of this is related to a Richardson variety, yeah, that I'm waving hands a little bit, but that's a way to prove it. Um, yeah, so, so right, they, they were looking at combinatorial formulas for these things, um, the Joe de Decan kind of stuff that comes up in algebraic combinatorics, and, and it also worked in K-theory. Okay, but it's on the So you, you, you almost gave, you're leaving the book, it's very true, and then you, and you're hearing your argument is like, um, kind of algebra. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of is. Um, yeah, so so what? what yeah, although it, it, they, they 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 kind of turned it into combinatorics too, because there's there's combinatorial polynomials in, in K theory that they use those rather than the geometry. Yeah, they use a bit of both. I mean, they're kind of they're doing both. So, yeah, I mean, what, what's happening here is like you've got some. Well, yeah, I want to introduce more symbols. Yeah, so this is yeah. the upshot of all this discussion is this is kind of a, a remarkable fact. So when you say sh um, like Schubert varieties, you literally just mean like Schubert cells make this right? Yeah. It's not, an it's not an abstract definition? No. Oh, okay. I really mean that. Yeah. So okay. when I say Schubert varieties, I just mean Schubert. Okay. And so I was just thinking about like defining this Richardson variety to be the intersection of transverse Schuberts. Like, uh, why does that have a I'm just confused, like, why is that important enough thing as a separate name? Mm, yeah, so this question gets asked a lot in lots of contexts is why is something so important that has a separate name? Uh, I can, uh, it's another story why it's named after Richardson. But um, I guess because if you intersect a Schubert variety and really a, a, an opposite Schubert variety, so I'll decorate it somehow. Um, why are those important? Well. Because if you expand, so this is some subvariety of the Grassmannian, so you can expand its class in the Schubert basis. And doing that is equivalent by point gray duality to knowing how to multiply two Schubert classes. So maybe that's the reason why these things are important. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And Thanks. if you want to do it in some more sophisticated cohomology theory like K theory, you need to, you, the first thing you need to do is understand the singularities of this kind of variety. Which turn out to be related to Schubert varieties too, but yeah, good question. Okay, I'm going to turn to equivariant uh, cohomology now, since that's where I wanted to go with this. 
Um, so I'm not going to define equivariant homology in any meaningful way. Um, I'm just going to say that I'm going to mention some of its properties and basically say that it um, uh, it's something that encodes um, how a uh, um, if you've got a, a, a group acting on a space, it encodes something about the orbits of that group action. Particular fixed points can be used. But again, I, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to assert things rather than prove them in, in this context. Um, I guess that's what I'm doing all along. But, um, <laughs> but these, they all have proofs. Most of them are not hard. Um, okay, so in this, so the setup here is I've got some big torus. Okay, I, I like to index it by z, but you can index it however you like. Um, large finite would be good enough acting on my big vector space. So uh, this torus is going to act on each Grassmannian and then also on on this big infinite dimensional one too. And I, I'm using this notation where the uh, there's characters of a torus, which you think, so what's a character of a torus? It's a map from T to C star, right? And so YI is going to be the map that picks out the i factor. Okay. And so that all that means is that this is the standard diagonal action on this big vector space with bases. Um, okay, so uh, the, the, the first major fact you need to know about equivariant cohomology is that it's, uh, at, the values on a point are some big polynomial, so very non-trivial. So, so, and it's going to be polynomials in all of these y's. Polynomials now, not uh, not power series. Um, yeah, and um, oh, I guess I might want to say yeah. It's okay. So. Another way to think about it. Wait, did something sneaky happen there where, so and actually Arnav had brought this up earlier in the chat, which is now you're taking polynomials and last time you took power series when like, of, the, of the affine grass, like you, you're in the affine grass winding, you're allowing power series. Um, you're allowing arbitrary, you can have like non, you can have non-zero rated bits all the way out. In, in cohomology? Yeah. No, no, no. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, it's. Yeah, I feel better. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, yeah, because it's a graded ring still. So you, uh, yes, yeah, good. Good. yeah and, and each graded piece has finite degree. Yes. But, but actually, uh, uh, it's a technical point, but I'll, I'll mention it here. The fact that this is the, the, the you know, this is a, a limit, right, of finite dimensional toruses, tori, not a co limit. And the same switch is going to happen where now this is going to be a co limit of finite dimensional polynomial rings, not a uh, limit. Hence, hence, yes, good. So, yeah. so in fact, it's all. Every, so all, all, all right, everything is as it should. Everything is as it should in, as a, as a in, in, in the setup. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So for 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 those of you who think about stacks, um, the, the cohomology, uh, equivariant cohomology of X is the stack quotient cohomology. And, and in our context, you, you can recover normal cohomology by setting all your y variables to zero. So you can always check anything I say by um, by by checking that. Okay, so let's compute the equivariant cohomology of the Grassmannian. It's actually basically the same. Um, there is a so so z played the role of of cohomology of a point before, um, and now it's cohomology of a point that goes there. I stick in some Chern class like things, and I mod out by Whitney some relations. And again, those those are all happening in large degrees. So as n goes to zero, uh, goes to infinity, I, they, the relations disappear, and I just get a polynomial. And here I'll, I'll say I've changed, I've switched things up anymore. These, these Cs no longer really play a role of segregate classes or turn classes. They're, they're turn classes of some virtual bundle. But what happened to the equivalent logical point? Oh, it's here. Oh, yeah, sorry. So this one is yeah. this one. There it is. Well, how big, wait, what's tor how big is the tor? Is it one dimensional or? Uh, yeah. it, oh, it's infinite dimensional, and, and that that y there. Oh, is, it's an underline. Okay. Is, is, is an underline. That's uh, y. I, I can't write this forever. It's a y one. It's all the y's. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so I, I should mention, like thinking. Um, so I should have said earlier, a, a lot of this kind of what I'll get to later kind of group is an offshoot of 
work in progress with Bill Fulton and, and the setting things up this way basically came from when he asked me, how can you make sense of, 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 of these kinds of turn classes? Um, uh, I had written down something that was nonsense when talking to him and you know, anyway, this, this came out to be just the right thing. When you take the limit, everything works. Um, okay, so what else? Uh, just as before, uh, the, um, the Schubert the classes of Schubert varieties are uh, going to form a basis now over the polynomial ring rather than over the integers. Okay, so, so you can multiply them. And now your coefficients are going to be polynomials in the y's because this is this is remember um, this is now in h t of a point. So again, th those y's are should maybe have an underline. The underline will disappear. So arbitrarily many y variables. Um, right. So it's going to be a homogeneous polynomial. It's still a graded ring. So this guy has degree size of mu, size of nu, size of lambda. And so to make up the degree, um, that's the degree of, of this polynomial. So you can kind of figure out, well, if, if, if this number is negative, then it should be zero. And you can, you can prove other uh, facts about when these things vanish. Um, so for example, they, they, you know, they look like, like this. So here's, here's a polynomial where I've got something of degree five plus three and something to degree two there, I'm sorry, six. So the, so yeah, five plus three minus two is, uh, five plus three minus six is, is two, so there's a degree two problem. Um, the, in the non equivariant case, these numbers were all non-negative integers, and that was a reflection of both geometry and combinatorics. Um, there's a wonderful theorem of um, Bill Graham, which says that these, um, polynomials are also, these polynomials are non-negative in the sense that they have non-negative coefficients if you write them in the right variables. And the right variables in this context is you should take a yi minus a yj where, where i is less than j. And okay, so we see that here, right? Um, this is all fine, the smaller ones come first. So I'm, I might misremember something from the non case, but I seem to recall that before you would have the Lambda had to be like size of mu plus size of mu. Uh, correct. Is that right? And here you're getting some lambdas that are not of sort of the expected size. Right. So the question is about the the expected size of lambda relative to right. mu so and b. It, it seems that you would get like a lot more, like a lot wider variety of partition lambda. Absolutely. So, so okay. the observation is that you get a lot more uh, partitions that can appear, and that's that's absolutely true. So, so the equivariant product is, is strictly richer than the non-equivariant one. Um, you'll you'll throw away lots of terms if you set all the y variables equal to zero. Um, yeah. But so the your your the degree of each y i is one. Yeah. Right. In the grading, right? Each y i is is in fact a first string class. I'm using complex grading here, but yeah. Each y is like a first string class to be one. Is there any geometry in the crystal Yes, these are the positive roots of um, of GL infinity, I guess, but yeah, of, of some group. You asked the question? Oh, sorry, yeah. So the question is, is there a geometric meaning of of, of this? And um, there's, there's at least two ways to think of it. Um, the kind of general Lee theory type is to say that these are positive roots in a certain sense. And maybe a geometric way to think of it is another way to do Schubert calculus is to do, is to take a Grassmann bundle, look at Schubert varieties in the Grassmann bundle and intersect them. But bundle over what? It's gonna be a bundle over a product of big projective spaces. And in that context, these will be the hyperplane classes. Um, Um, right. So, um, so you can, in fact, say a little bit more. The, so Alan Knudsen observed that 
uh, Bill Graham's proof shows that these are um, these coefficients are actually just square free monomials in in um, in these variables. I'm sorry, sums of square free monomials in these variables, which constrains things a little bit. Uh, which kind of things come up here? And there are again many wonderful formulas for uh, for these um, um, equivariant polynomials uh, by uh, these folks and and actually many others with different formulas. Okay, so now you know what I want to do. I want to do the co-product, um, and so that's what we'll do. So the same um, co-product map that we had before, the direct sum map, uh, respects the T action, uh, where the T T is now acting diagonally on, on on this space, and I guess it's also diagonally here. And so we get a pullback map in equivariant cohomology. Whenever you have a, a morphism that respects the T action, you get a pullback map in equivariant cohomology. Actually, I'm getting scared. Does it respect the T action? The T action is actually. It doesn't, doesn't seem to respect my T action. Are you not? I thought you were going to be in the basis and your basis and basis system. Ah, well, okay. Good. So, of course, Ravi caught me. Caught me. Caught me. Caught me. Um, I, I didn't. So, the, 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 the worry is, right, that we don't, that, that, that it doesn't respect the T action. So, this does not respect the T action. Oh, you said. <laughs> so I think that's what, so the question is, well, if you want to make that isomorphism by interlacing, then, then that, no, that does not respect the T action. However, you don't need to do that isomorphism. Um, so I, I, I threw that in as motivation early on, um, but, but for this map to, to work, you don't need it. Um, and so, so I, I deliberately left that off and went, um, it was trying yeah. to trick you, but. Um, and the very first isomorphism, that last line there, is that true? Like, that's not obviously true. The goal, the goal that's not obvious, but it's a calculation. Okay, so, yeah. uh, okay. so this, is, this is a calculation. This was a joint choice. Um, uh, maybe. So is it a choice? Um, it's a, it's a choice maybe of how to realize this as a union of sub of, of finite dimensional gas models. Okay. And you still have to calculate something and check that it works. Yes, but it's the same calculation that we did on the previous slide where, where each one of these finite gas models. So maybe now you should think of this as a two, you know, two M half dimensional spaces in a multiple of four, four you know, dimensional space. But the kind of the same reasoning works. Yeah. What doesn't happen, there's, and I don't think there's any way to rescue it, is if you're letting T acts diagonally here and on the finite dimensional spaces too, you don't have finitely many fixed points. The fixed point locus gets really big. So if you want to do you know, GKM kind of fixed point localization, um, you got to be either more sophisticated or, or just give that up to, to work with this, which is fine. OK. Um, so, um, so, but we can still, so because, um, so there's still Schubert classes, say by this isomorphism, and uh, I can still pull them back, and I still get some co-product um, numbers there, or polynomials now, and um, you, can, you can ask what they are. And, and so here, here's some computations. Um, so no longer square for each group. So, so they're no longer square free, first of all, you see that square. And they're no and, longer positive. And they're no longer positive in kind of an obvious way, right? Because here I've got y0 minus y1, minus my y minus one, and also y0 minus y plus one. So it's a, it's a little curious what's going on. So, um, so what does positivity mean here? Well, um, so there's a, a theorem which is, uh, Proved by Lam Li and Shimizana, which says that they are positive. This is a curly, um, curly uh, sign, so not just greater than J. Um, but the the order here is you put all of the positive <laughs> integers first, 
and then you put all the negative or non-positive integers next and everything else is it sounds like physics yeah right <laughs> so that that's how you do it um, um so i i managed to um Sorry, what does this create inequality? It, it just means this. This is the order. If you can, oh, if you, okay. you can oh, interpret okay. dot, so dot, dot. In that particular exactly. Order. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it means. Yeah. So that's what the curly inequality means. Um, so furthermore, it is a sum of square free terms if uh, they have the same sign in the usual sense, and it's at, at most squares if they have opposite signs. So um, that's that's for Alan Knudsen's uh, favorite property of the C's. That this is the version of that for the D's. Um, so uh, the the original proof of this involved going. Um, to the inf to the infinite affine Grassmannian, and then using Peterson's um, affine to quantum correspondence and the corresponding fact in the quantum cohomology of G mod B. Um, so 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 the, the original proof of this involved the, the affine to quantum correspondence due to Dale Peterson. So it, it's known that there's some positivity that happens in quantum cohomology. And this was proved. It's like a proof Peterson thing or a non-proof Peterson. It approved Peterson thing. So okay. by Lamb and Shimazone. Okay. So yeah. So it's proved. Um, and 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 a, a question we don't came is is from earlier, which is under the isomorphism of the GRV GRV O plus G O plus V. Uh, yep. Uh, yep. The first one of where does Y where does the where does Y I uh, yeah, that, that, yep. Yeah. Uh, here or? Yes, exactly. This. Uh, yeah. So where do, where the Y, is it possible to say where the YI is? Okay, yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. The YI is good at YIs. And, uh, and maybe, maybe, maybe uh, CI is good at what I was calling old CIs because it's the turn class, the, 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 the turn classes of this double thing. Yeah. CI yeah, some so I found this much I think I'm asking you to repeat something you've already said. But sure. for this, in the equivariant case for the C's, mm. um, what was known about the good square freeness? Uh, oh, for the C's. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're saying it's weird, but for the C's, you were getting some positivity. They're, they're, they're non negative sum. So it's, the question is for the C's, what's known about square freeness? Um, Graham's proof, as observed by Knudsen, shows that. The C's are non negative sums of square free monomials in the yi minus yj's. Okay. Yeah. And so, what's true in, for the D's now we put forward is that, uh, is that, um, is this. Yeah. And so, if you're careful, you, so I, I guess, I, so I give mostly a different proof. I had to use it, rely on something. Um, so this is a partially independent proof, not completely, in the sense that I maybe will try to skip over. But basically, you use this realization of, of this direct sum of Schubert varieties as Richardson's, and then you can apply Graham's theorem to that. There's an extra, there's a specialization, I should say here, with the specialization of torus variables, and that specialization. Is what produces this weird order. Okay, so this weird order kind of comes from. You can't imagine it. I, 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 I suppose oh, you could get a weird order by specializing variables in a weird way, and that, that's in fact what happens. Um, okay, so um, great. That's the. Uh, First thing I wanted to tell you about positivity. Uh, I'll, I want to highlight that formulas are, I think, not known so well. So they're, 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 I, I didn't give you any formulas for the C's, but I told you that there are lots of wonderful ones, and, and there are. Um, there are some non-positive formulas, so you can compute them. 
um, and and Mola did compute them, in fact. Um, and um, there's another way to compute them, which is maybe which is using this kind of Thomas and Young uh, Richardson variety idea. And I realize now this is a little small for people looking online, but what I've done here is kind of I've, I've put mu below an n by n rectangle and I put nu to the right of an n by n rectangle. So I've, I've concocted some big um, partition out of mu and nu. And I guess I'll, I'll say this is what Thomas and Young called something like this. I guess that, that, that slanty line is meant to indicate that you put mu below and mu above. Uh, so there's a way to compute this using just kind of ordinary sure function calculus. Although it's a funny thing because now I've got different variables. So the y's, are, are, these y primes are different from these y's, and they're specialized in a funny way. So I, this feels like it. This feels like not a satisfactory answer. It's better than one thing, but it doesn't it, feel like it's in my right. Mind. The computer will do it for you. So I can, I, you, you want any class, any any one of these, I can give it to you. But it's not, um, it's not in in it's not as it's not a wonderful formula in the way. That the ones for the C's uh, is wonderful. So uh, this is still sort of a big question. Um, let's see. So uh, there's a, another kind of uh, question, which is partly answered. So I, I guess I've alluded to a couple times before that um, I just did tacitly or implicitly uh, that the, the this uh, cohomology ring is is isomorphic to the ring of symmetric functions. Um, and we can try to write down polynomials uh, for all these classes that I've talked about. And uh, in ordinary cohomology, the class is the classical Schur polynomial, which you can write as some determinant in C's. Uh, so this is like the Jacobi Trudy formula, if you know about that. Um, and then you can do the same thing equivariantly, and there's something called a double Schur polynomial. and um, yeah, without saying, so it also has a determinantal formula. Uh, now you have to put some y's in there somehow, but it, it, there's a determinant um, expression for this as well. And so uh, this computation of, of um, products in the, in the equivalent homology of the corresponding becomes just a computation of polynomials. And so you can realize these polynomials that way. So, um, you then might try to do the same thing for the, the dual side. And so that leads to a question, which is like, what, 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 are, what are the polynomials in two sets of variables that multiply with structure constants, the Ds? Um, so that is to say, if I, 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 can, I can try to write them like this. So we know if, if, if Y is all go to zero, we know that the Ds become the Cs and these are just gonna be the shared polynomials. So it's just gonna be some deformation of the shared polynomials. And um, so uh, in, in almost precisely this language, Knudsen and Lederer uh, looked at the case where, where all the y's, a very special case of the y. So they're all zero for negative ones, and they're all just the same, say, delta. So this is, this is now a circle action. Um, but in, in fact, Molov, I, I believe, um, even, slightly before, although it wasn't obvious he was looking at the same ring at all. Um, 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 figured out the, the, the general case and he called these things dual sure polynomials and gave formulas for them. Um, and and the, the, again, you know, this is another thing that Lambie and Shimizono observed um, that, that these kind of combinatorially are the same polynomials. Uh, so um, the way to think about this, though, is that is that what's going on is the these T's are representing Schubert classes in the homology of of this infinite dimensional grass money, which has a ring structure uh, kind of coming from this um, from this direct sum. But now I feel more nervous about for homology of the infinite dimensional. Like what, what, uh, you don't mean of Schubert. Things because Schubert things are infinite dimensional, right? Um, I mean, they're so there's also finite dimensional. So, so what, what Schubert class do I mean? 
um, there's a, a finite co-dimension Schubert variety. That's the one I've been talking about all along. But there's a transverse to that. There's a finite dimensional Schubert variety, which is, it's really transverse to that. It's sort of the, the dual, the Poincaré dual thing in homology. And that, that's what this thing is going to represent. So you can do it algebraically by saying like, well, this thing is just the formal dual of cohomology, and this is a class that is dual to the uh, Schubert basis, but, but it's also actually an honest homology class. So maybe, maybe here's a, I don't know, I don't know if it's a dumb question or not. Like there's two ways of building stuff as a union of finite dimensional things versus this, oh, I see, maybe it's the same thing. Okay, okay. Well, I want to make sure that, that you get, okay. It yeah. really is the same thing. It's the same thing, yeah. Right. Because you, you're taking a union of finite dimensional things in the homology, <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll put it in there just the way you want it to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I want to mention another problem, uh, question. So you can do the same thing for the infinite five variety, which I haven't talked about, but you can imagine what it is. And um, you no longer get a co-product, but you get a co-module structure on, the, on this, on this uh, ring. It, it, so this is like, it's not a, you know, this is not a hot algebra anymore, but it, it is a, a co-module. And um, you can try to do the, same, do the same thing with Schubert classes here. So these are now indexed by some permutations and, um, and you get um, some coefficients the same way that display the same positivity. Uh, but I think we, we don't know what the corresponding polynomials should be. So um, it, we know what they are. Um, actually, what do you mean? You, so you, meaning like you, they're well-defined but you don't know, or is the issue that they're not well defined or they are well defined and you don't know, what sense do you not I, I, I don't, you that? Yeah, yeah, I think, I think not even I defining them clearly is, is something that- So they're not well defined. They're not super well defined. I, so, I, don't, I don't know what the meaning I, is. Yeah, well good question. So I don't, I don't know, what, so these things should exist. I don't know how to define them and I much less know how to compute them. Although I have ideas about both of those things. Okay. Um, but, um, so there, there is, this thing does exist, the, the, the homology of this infinite dimensional space. Um, and, and these classes all exist. And so you can kind of use that to define them. Um, I, I suppose if you work out, so I don't think any, so the sense in which they're not well-defined is that no one has written it down, but I think you could. Uh, computing them in any useful sense is, is, a, is a whole other question. And I would say, even when the y's are non, are, are go to zero, it's still, Maybe something that you haven't computed. So, um, all right. So, um, I want to wrap up pretty quickly since we're running low on time. Uh, and I want to say something we've, I've said it kind of in, com in conversation with people here uh, in the room the words affine grass mining in several times. So, uh, but I wasn't talking about the affine grass mining honestly before. So, let me do that quickly to, to close with. Um, so here's the thing you can do uh, on a countable dimensional vector space. You can shift variables just sending i to i minus one. And that's an automorphism of the infinite dimensional space. You can realize it as a limit of nil buttons on finite dimensional ones. So here's a definition that you may or may not like, um, <laughs> but, but it's a definition and it, it, and it matches up with other definitions that you may like better, but it, from this point of view, we know what this space is. It's some of these, some limit of half dimensional spaces. And the affine Grassmannian says, well, if you do this shift off automorphism to your subspace n times, you should end up inside the space that you started with. So that's, that's what the affine Grassmannian is. Um, and, and it has a, a, an action of a torus. And the, in order to play nicely with the shift automorphism, you need to sickly embed your, you need to be a finite dimensional torus and you need to sickly embed it um, kind of by repeating, yeah, these coordinates just kind of get repeated. And so it'll act. And, okay. I would love if this were compatible with direct sum because then I could understand the homology product on the finite, on this affine grass volume. Um, but it, it, it's not in, in any like meaningful way. Um, uh, and part of the issue is it kind of, uh, yeah, I, I don't know what to put there. So I just simply don't know. Um, so th this, this will have some image. It's not gonna be isomorphic to an affine grass monument in a beautiful way. Um, however, um, now I'm gonna cheat. 
or I don't know, like really cheat. So it was asked very early on whether this um, um, infinite dimensional Grassmannian is loops U, it is loops U. Uh, it's also BU, which is spot periodicity. But um, so this is a group uh, and, and kind of in, the, in some appropriate homotopy category, this is, these are the same. And then the finite dimensional um, kind of acting Grassmannians embed this way. So you, now you, you can kind of use homotopy to say that, you, that there's a product there. And um, you can use that product and kind of basically um, use Bott's theorem to, to, to prove, uh, to, to come up with a, a, a presentation of the, um, a, a, of the integral echogram homology of this, this space. What's Bott's theorem? Uh, but but shows, yeah so yeah so, but but steer in this context is is this without the uh, without the t's so it's it's the non equivalent version of this um, he he says that yeah and a, a question from Joachim is is GLV uh, cross is about is GLV cross flag variety for flag variety related to the direct sum operation on the flag variety? Uh, GL, GRV or GLV? He wrote GL. I believe he meant GR. Uh, G, so GRV. Yeah, Peter's nodding. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So it, it is the direct sum. So if you got a, so think about it this way: you got a flag and you've got a subspace. Well, you can just add that subspace to every component of the flag. Yeah, so that, that, that's how the direct sum works, and that that gives rise to the global operation. Um, Okay, I'm, I'm out of time. Um, so this seems like as good a place as any to stop, but um, um, yeah, so thanks for this. So, 